All right, second week New Testament survey. Again, this is our uh, our agenda for the class. Last week we did an introduction where we looked mostly at historical stuff. And by the way, when, when, when I did the introduction last week, and I'm gonna um, let me correct something. I didn't didn't do it wrong. I just didn't do it. I gave you several questions about who were the Sadducees and Pharisees and why did they like each other and why did Jesus speak Aramaic and why are the Gospels written in Greek. I answered all those questions, right? Yes. You know all the answers to those. One thing I didn't mention, um, I asked the question that I didn't answer it is who were the Samaritans and why didn't the Jews like them? Okay? You cannot really understand the parable of the Good Samaritan unless you know the answer to that. When in 722 BC, when the nation of Assyria destroyed the northern kingdom, uh, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah still existed. They were they lasted for 140 years later to 586 when the Babylonians destroyed them. But when the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed in 722 BC by the Assyrians, I told you the Assyrians were very efficient. As conquerors, they would carry part of the people off to other places by force, sell them into slavery, force them to intermarry, and they would bring other slave peoples in, force them to intermarry. The Samaritans were half-breeds, if you will. I don't mean that to be a derogatory term, but it's, it's the clearest way to explain it. They were part Jews, and they were part something else. So they were considered to be impure by the Jews. Not only that, but because the northern kingdom of Israel had been separated from Jerusalem and the temple when the two kingdoms split, they had created their own way of worshiping. In fact, they had their own version of the Ten Commandments, only there were eleven commandments. They had added, and the eleventh commandment said that God had ordained that they set up a place to worship on Mount Gerizim, which was right outside the city of Samaria. Samaria was the capital, the city of Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. So the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along because originally they had been from two kingdoms that had split and often were at war, but also because the Samaritans had their own heretical version, according to the Jews, of, of the Jewish faith, and which added another commandment and changed a lot of other things too, and they were not pure-blooded Jews anymore. So the Jews from Judah said, okay, they're not really Jews by genetics, because they're intermarried with all these other people, they're, they're mutts, and secondly, they're not really Jews by their faith, because they, they have a perverted, a wrong version, and they worship on Mount Gerizim, not at the temple. So, and so the Jews treated the Samaritans badly, and the Samaritans responded by not liking the Jews, which is why the, if you, the good Samaritan, a Levite, a person from the household, from the tribe, responsible for being priests, and a priest, two people that represented Judaism in what's supposed to be the best versions, walked by this, this man who had been robbed and beaten and, and walked on the other side of the road so they wouldn't even have to look at him. A Samaritan who would have been hated, a half-breed, a heretic, somebody the Jews would think, you know, doesn't barely deserves to live, he stops and takes care of the man and even pays to have him cared for at a local inn. That story of the Good Samaritan only makes sense if you understand. Jesus is talking to Jews, and he says, and, and he said, you know, love your neighbors yourself. And they said, well, who's my neighbor? And he said, let me tell you a story. The story is that the Samaritan took a Jew and took care of him as his neighbor. That's what it means to love your neighbor, somebody that you don't like. You've got every reason not to like. Do you see? That story makes much more sense if you know what the Samaritans were. And the value of the money that he left with the innkeeper, <coughs> about a year's pay or something like that, was, was not a, an insignificant amount of money. That he yeah, I'd have to go back and look at, at what that constituted in terms, but he left uh, silver coins, I think it was. Yeah. So, uh, to, to take care of the man. So, I forgot to tell to give that answer to the question I had asked last week, so I wanted to bring you up to speed on it. Any questions about that? Do you understand how under, that, that background material helps you understand so much more what, what the New Testament is about in many cases? All right. Today we're going to look at the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I will explain to you why they are the Synoptic Gospels. I've mentioned it already, but we'll do that again. Um, and then next week we will pick up the fourth Gospel, the Gospel of John, and the book of Acts. Now, this was the, the, what I gave you last week, roughly, in terms of timeline, I put, and this will be online, uh, if you 
you go onto the website. But the part I mentioned here that I've got outlined um, is the part that really affects where we're coming up to. In 198 BC, the Seleucid dynasty in Antioch, Syria, defeats the Ptolemies and takes over the Holy Land. In 167, the Jews, led by pious Jewish priest Mattathias and his sons, revolt against the Syrian king Antiochus IV Epiphanes. We talked last week about the oppression that Antiochus IV Epiphanes had put on the Jews. They were successful, and three years later, in 164, the Jews returned to Jerusalem and cleansed the temple, which is the first Hanukkah, the celebration of Hanukkah, the festival of lights, is because of that cleansing of the temple. And this is... This is called the uh, Maccabean Rebellion, and it led to the Hasmonean dynasty of Jewish rulers. So, in 142 to 63, Hasmoneans, led by Judas Maccabeus, continued to oppose Syria, asking Rome to help. That was a mistake, it turned out. <coughs> and then in 63 BC, the general Roman Pompey uh, captures Jerusalem for Rome, and in 40 BC, Rome appoints King Herod as king over Judea. He was not Roman, he was not Jewish. He was half Idumean, which were the Edomites, being descended from Esau, and he was half uh, Arabic. His mother was from Arabia. And yet, he became king over the Jews because the Romans said so. So that's the time period that we're looking at. Today we want to talk about the Gospels. As always, stop me if you have questions. The four Gospels that uh, we are going to deal with three of today, but we want to give all four of, of them to you here. Um, we have four Gospel accounts. The four Gospels, I think I said last week in here, or I may have been in Bible study, we have four different accounts of the life and earthly ministry of Jesus. Why four? And why aren't they exactly the same? Well, as I said last week, a... Uh, Judge once said that as a judge, if somebody, if four witnesses were to come before my court to give testimony of their experiences or their knowledge of something, if they all four completely agreed, and especially if they all four used exactly the same language, I would throw them out of court because I would know that there was this was false, there was collusion. They had gotten together and made sure that their stories were straight. It is by nature more realistic has more veracity, more truthfulness to have four testimonies which are fundamentally consistent in what they present, but do have some variations. When I taught the, I did a class two years ago uh, on the Christmas narrative in the Gospels, which is a little tough because there is no Christmas narrative in Mark. Okay, he starts with John the Baptist. And yet, <coughs> there is something to be learned about that. I actually did a little demonstration and I took four people. Some of you were in this study, you probably remember it. And I had one person stand right by the front door where that screen blocks part of the sanctuary, one person standing over where they could see everything, one standing inside this room, and one by the back door. And then I stood out in the middle and I sort of danced around or whatever. And then I would move just a little bit to the left, and a little bit to the right, and a little bit forward, and a little bit back. There was only one of them that could see everything I did. The other four only had a partial experience of it. They couldn't see everything. And yet they could report on what they saw, and what they saw was not inconsistent, it didn't contradict the rest of it, it was just understanding that there are four different people may have four different views, because they're standing on different sides, and there may be other things that may block part of their view. That's what happened with the four Gospels. They are not contradictory, they are complementary, and in fact one of the ways we can see them to be complementary is each of them, based upon who they were writing to, and what priority we believe the Holy Spirit laid on their hearts, each of them had a different objective in mind and presents Jesus in a slightly different uh, emphasis. I don't want to say presented in different focus, but a different emphasis. Matthew, for instance, is the most Jewish of the four. He presents Jesus as the King of Israel, the Christ, or perhaps I should say the Messiah, which would be more appropriate to the Jewish part, the Son of David, and he talks about him being the heir to David, the you know, uh, son of David is, is a term that Matthew uses more than anyone else, and that uh, he is the Messiah who is greater even than Moses. So while Matthew is coming from a Jewish perspective, and he presents Jew, uh, Jesus as being Jewish, the king of Israel, and not just the king, but the Messiah of Israel. And again, forgive me when I, duplicate, when I say things over and over, but some things you need to remember. The word Messiah is Hebrew. It's from the Hebrew word Mashiach, the Messiah. 
The Greek word, same word in Greek, is Christus, Christ. Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. Both of them mean the anointed one. And who was it that got anointed? Kings. When God, uh, when the Israelites said they wanted a king, and he said, you don't really want a king, they said, yes, yes, give us a king like all the other places. God called up the prophet Samuel to go and find Saul, the first king, and do what? Anoint him. To anoint him as king. Later on, when Saul <clears throat> violates uh, his relationship with God and God calls, is going to call up a new king, he goes and Samuel goes and finds the boy shepherd David. And what? Anoints him. The king that God has selected is the one who gets anointed, which is what the words Messiah and Christ mean. It means the one who is to be king. Okay? So, Matthew presents Jesus as the king of Israel, the Messiah, the son of David, very Jewish. Mark comes along. Mark is writing to an audience, as we'll talk about, probably in Rome, but very Gentile audience. For, and the, the way we know that is because Mark uses some Latin words. There's not much Latin in the New Testament, but the Romans are ruling. Okay, And if he's writing to Christians in a Gentile Christians, then Latin would have been used. He uses a few Latin words. He explains, the, the, he translates some Aramaic words, since Aramaic was the common language of the day, and he explains some of the Jewish customs. When he talks about some of the Jewish festivals, he explains what they are, which means the people that he's writing to wouldn't have known that. Matthew doesn't explain any of those kinds of things, because he was writing to Jews who would have known all that. So Mark presents Jesus as the suffering servant of the Lord. That he is the one who uh, suffered for us. It is probably the earliest gospel, which we will talk about. There's differences of opinion about that. Uh, but it is a huge, a huge discussion. There's way more emphasis on it than there ought to be. But we've got to talk about that because if not, someday you'll be reading about stuff and you'll get hung up on that. The third gospel uh, of the synoptics is Luke. He presents Jesus as the son of man. Now it is a perfect man. And a man who, because he is the Son of God as well, provides salvation for all of humanity. This is the most complete, the longest biography of all, uh, the longest of all the Gospels, and the most complete biography. And Luke was himself a Gentile. Again, some people argue about that. Some people said he was a Hellenized Jew. Not likely. There's even one place where Paul is describing some of his companions, and he lumps them into Jews and Gentiles. You know, there's these three... Jewish brothers who traveled with me, and then there are my Gentile uh, friends, and he lists Luke amongst the Gentiles. Um, so he presents, Luke presents Jesus as the Son of Man. Then you have John, not one of the synoptic gospels. You will remember synoptic means to see the same or same seeing. Uh, one way you can translate that is seen together, because you can put them next to each other and they have a lot of the same material. John is completely different. He's very different than the other. Because he is not concerned about what happened, but what it meant. It's a theological work. And so John presents Jesus as the divine, eternal Son of God, more theological, less historical. And it presents him as the Son of God who came to earth in human form. And as I say, the most theological and symbolic of the Gospels. Now we are today... Uh, let me talk a little bit about what a gospel means. The word gospel comes from old Anglo-Saxon word, most of us are old Anglo-Saxons, uh, which was literally Godspell. Remember the musical, Godspell? That's the original form from which we get gospel, and in Anglo-Saxon it meant good story or good tidings. It is um, an old Anglo-Saxon translation or version of the word euvangelion, which is a Greek word, which means good news. Euvangelion, the Latin version of that is evangelium. Does that sound familiar? Evangelium is where we get the Latin, or with the Greek root, is where we get the word for evangelism, or evangelical, or even evangel. In evangel is angel. Because um, the evangelium or euvangelion means literally an announcement or a proclamation. And particularly, it means a good announcement or proclamation. That EU on the front of that, euangelion, it means good. That's where we get the words um, eulogy. 
to say something good about someone. That's where we get words like euphoria, a good feeling. That EU on the front of it means that it was a good thing. And the evangelion, or the angelion, is a message. So it's a good message, a good tiding, a good word. And angelion, an angel, literally means a messenger. That's what an angel is. It comes from that Greek root. All the things you now know. <laughs> you can speak Greek and Latin and all kinds of stuff now. Okay? But it's important to know that there are both Greek and Latin roots to our idea of what these Gospels are. Now, a Gospel in antiquity, not in Scripture, but in ancient Greek and Roman times, was not a written document. It was sort of a newsflash. It meant a broadcast, not, not by you know, electronic media, but some, you know, some, a runner came and brought word that either a battle had been won. For instance, when you know Marathon, the, the running of a marathon originated from the Battle of Marathon. When they won the battle, which they were sure they were going to lose, the Greek runner ran 26 miles to deliver the news that they had actually won the battle, and then he fell over dead. So don't run a marathon without training. That's, that's the theme in that story. But uh, when he came and gave this news of a victory in battle, that would have been considered a gospel, if you will. Uh, an euangelium, a bit of good news. When a new emperor was born, you know, a son to the emperor, they would send out a flash of good news, a gospel. So gospel is kind of a strange word to use for these writings that we have. Uh, we know what it means. It means an, a proclamation or declaration of something that really good, good news, something to make people happy. But our biblical gospels have always been something of a mystery because no, well, there's been huge arguments about what kind of literary form do they constitute. See, down through history, and this is where you'll read, you'll read the term literary criticism. Okay. There are certain kinds of, of things that are written. I mean, there's a difference between a newspaper article and a biography and a short story and a novel and a, you know, etc. There are different kinds of writings that are intended to do different kinds of things. Well, literary criticism is, is a way to help understand why something was written and what it's meant to do based upon what kind of writing it is. Fair? Well, the problem is, there's nothing else quite like our Gospels. Again, even the word would not have been used for a written document until it started being used for these. <coughs> until fairly recently, most scholars thought that the Gospels, <coughs> the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were actually a completely new and different kind of literature. That they were unique in all the world. Just like I told you last week, I think, in either this class or the other, uh, other New Testament class, i got to start, stop doing classes that are so close together. Um, that Koine Greek or common Greek that is used in the Bible, that for um, a long time scholars thought that that was the only example they had of that kind of Greek was in the Bible, the New Testament. And so they thought maybe that what they called it, actually called it Holy Ghost Greek. Because they thought maybe the Holy Spirit had invented that special version of Greek just to write the scriptures with. Well, since then they have found many examples of that because they're still finding stuff where Koine Greek or Common Greek was used in business transactions and you know, personal letters and all kinds of stuff. But in the same way, until very fairly recently, they thought that the Gospels were a unique kind of literature. They really weren't anything else. And they've gone back and forth. Some uh, literary critics have said that they really are a kind of a biography. But what kind of biography doesn't give you any details about somebody's 33-year-old life except for the last three years? Right? It's, it doesn't seem that the whole focus is to tell the story of Jesus' life or that it give you some more details about what he was doing when he was 19. Nothing. I mean, we got, we got his birth, we've got one story of when he was 12 years old, and then we pick up again when he's about 30, and nothing in between. So in that regard, it's not really biography. There's a special kind of story called, an, or a kind of literature called an erotology, which the Greeks used, which were stories about the deeds of gods and very special people. And some people said it's an erotology, but it's not, you know, it's got too much sort of common information. Those are all about throwing lightning bolts and all that kind of stuff. You don't get the sense that there's actually a historical event going on. And yet, we've got that in the Gospels. And then some people had proposed that the Gospels were entirely intended to be kerygma, or sermons. 
that, that they are a, uh, just a focused, extended kind of sermon about Jesus in order to convert people. Because the Gospels do say, I write this so that you may know that Jesus is and was the Son of God. Okay? They are very charismatic, very sermon-like in that. The latest decision is that they are sort of charismatic biographies, <laughs> which means that they've got elements that are consistent with sermons that had existed before as a form. And they're very similar in some ways to biographies, but they're kind of a, a unique hybrid in that regard. And they're a hybrid because of the fact that there clearly is, uh, there are goals associated with it. They're not just wanting to tell a biography, so hey, you know, you want to hear the stories about Jesus? No, it's, did you know Jesus was the Son of God? Let me tell you why we believe that. I mean, there's, there's a very uh, sermon-like focus to them, but they are biographical, they are historical in that part, uh, in that regard. <coughs> Now, uh, the balance, yes? Is there any, any academic study that might have tried to determine what happened between Christ age 12 and age 30? To determine what is happening? There's nothing to study. There are no other Nobody's resources. Out there, no, nobody's... Nope, I mean, there, well, there's, no, there's nothing to look at. The, the only other references, we have a, a few references to the, to the historical reality of Jesus. We have a couple of references in Josephus. One of them is, his, the historians pretty much discount, because one of them is fairly neutral. There was this man, Crestus, who ended up being executed, and he was a horrible guy, because he apparently did all sorts of terrible things. And then there's another passage that's supposed to be Josephus. The style is very different, the language is very different, and it touts that Jesus was the Messiah, and he's really wonderful and everything else, and they go, that's not likely. Tacitus was another historian that referred to him. Suetonius is another one. And again, Suetonius was a, wrote to the emperor and said, I'm having trouble with these people who belong to this sect that follow this Crestus. The, and he says it in such a way that he expected that the emperor would know who that was, because Christians were fairly well known. Nero specifically persecuted the Christians, because he tried to blame them for burning down Rome, when apparently he did it. So, but we have several independent, non-biblical references to the fact that Jesus was a real historical person, but no details. <coughs> they don't exist. So, anybody, I'm, I'm sure there are people who have tried to say, okay, this is what happened between 12 and 30, but the only thing they can do is make it up, because we don't have any details. Right? We'll talk a little bit later about why they weren't too concerned about writing stuff down about Jesus, especially early on, uh, okay, and why they had very different priorities back then. For instance, the date of a person's birth was not considered a big deal. You didn't celebrate birthdays the way you did. And so they didn't think it was of any significance that they recognized or, or, or made a note of when Jesus, what day Jesus was born or what month he was born. Um, now, they made a specific note of when he was crucified. We know exactly when that happened because it's, it's tied to the Jewish calendar, which we have record of that. You know, we know how that was calculated. It's a lunar calendar. And it was on the Passover, and we know when Passover was calculated. So that sort of thing we can do. But again, they have very different priorities. You read these letters, and they, in most of them, Paul being an exception, most of them don't say who wrote them. Well, if you are going to sit down and spend how much time in your life to write one of these things, don't you think you'd put your name on it? But not them. Because they didn't have that priority. The reason Paul's letters have, have his name on them is because they were letters to individual people. Okay. You put your name on it if you're writing a letter to a person. You don't put your name on it if you're writing a uh, story about Jesus that you think in order to let people know. Because you're not the point. You're not the focus. We don't get that. Back then, it was considered that any time you wrote something for the community, it was for the community. It wasn't for you. You didn't put your name on it. So some of what we bump into here with things like dates and names and whatnot is because they just have a completely different set of priorities than we do. But there is no data between age 12 for Jesus and age 30, approximately, we believe age 30. Um, and it would take somebody like the, the supposed professors of the Jesus Seminar to make stuff up gotcha. in order for us to have anything to work with. Better to leave it alone, because there's no data there. Unless they were to discover, which they might, you know, they find some other cache of parchments or uh, papyri writings and that tell us something about the first century and Jesus, then we would look at it. Obviously, that's been the fodder of a bunch of movies. You guys have read some of those, right? The Word was one of those movies, that's sort of a mini-series on TV about somebody who found a, another gospel, you know, which talked about Jesus. So. But we don't have the data right now, so we don't make anything up. Bob? 
There is the Gospel of Thomas, or one of those strange Gospels that tells sort of wild stories of Jesus' childhood. There is, and they are crazy. Um, have you guys read any of those things, Gospel of Thomas, or, or um, if I can find it here real quick, <coughs> let me give you a, a couple of things from the Gospel, a couple of quotes from the Gospel of Thomas, if I can find it. Um, yeah, there are a number of Gospels, while I'm looking for this, which purport to be stories about Jesus. Some of them are obviously problematic because, and they, t they talk about Jesus' childhood, you know. There's one called the infancy narratives of um, somebody or other. I think it's uh, Peter. I think that's right. Um, and they say, for instance, that Jesus, when he was a child, performed miracles. He worked in his father Joseph's um, uh, carpenter shop, and Joseph was kind of a screwball, and he got things wrong, and like he made a bed too short one time, so Jesus just grabbed it and stretched it. So it's bigger than <laughs> and how Jesus was so perfect that when that uh, he worked with his father, and when Jesus made thrones, they were so perfect that kings from all over the world came to buy thrones from Joseph's little carpenter shop in Nazareth. But we also have cases where Jesus, as a child, you know, these these false these false they're, they're called the pseudepigraphal or false writings, um, where Jesus took some clay and made a form of a bird, and then just sort of miraculously made it come to life, and it just flew off. And we've also got cases where he got mad at other kids and struck them dead. Oh, wow. a child. Um, you know, that sounds like something from Twilight Zone, doesn't it? Uh, so, oh, darn, I'm not finding this. Well, there are passages, I, I will find that for you next week, because we're going to be looking at John next week, the Gospels again. The Gospel of Thomas, you'll be reading along, the Gospel of Thomas is a collection of sayings that are purportedly of Jesus. You'll be reading along and you'll be thinking, will these sound... Oh, not bad. They sound kind of consistent with Jesus. And then he'll say something like, the apostles told Jesus to, to send Mary away because they didn't like her because she was a woman. And, and Jesus said, don't worry about Mary. I'm going to turn her into a male. And when I turn her into a male, then she will be eligible for heaven. In fact, all of the women that I turn into males will then be eligible for heaven because as women, they can't get into heaven. And you're going, what? <laughs> you know? And, and, and other sayings which are just don't make any sense. They are just, you know, lunacy. They're like craziness. And I'm not finding Gospel of Thomas. I really want to read you a couple of those because they're just... Um, so talk amongst yourselves for two seconds. Gospel of Thomas, 7, 9. Have you guys read any of those Gospel of Thomas or Genesis? Yeah, I actually had somebody once say, well, and by the way, this is the thing, if you if you read or the books or seen the movies, um, uh, Da Vinci Code and Dan Brown purports that um, there are all these other Gospels that got rejected and Constantine in the 4th century for political reasons in order to, so, so, to solidify his own support, he decided what was going to be in the Bible and it was entirely up to him and nobody really believed that Jesus was the Messiah before that. Okay, not to put too fine a point on it, but from a historical point of view, that's all a crock. It's really wrong. It is the the books that we have in our Bible, the Gospels, were determined. The four Gospels were settled on by the start of the second century. So we're talking by the church, by the local churches. So we're talking 60, 70 years after Jesus. Um, the rest of the whole New Testament was nailed down in one eighties by the church fathers. That's 150 years before Constantine and, and the Council of Nicaea, which is when Dan Brown and others said they did that. So, um, when, and I read that book, and some of you all have heard me say this before. Uh, I, I read, uh, here you go, found it. I, I read The Da Vinci Code before it became fam you know, hugely popular. And I told Carol, you know, this is fun. It's kind of a fun read and everything else. But the problem is, it is so wrong from a historical point of view, and I said, and the danger is people are going to read this and think that it's true. In fact, Dan Brown in the preface says, this is all true. Dan, 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 I worry for you, brother. I don't think the Lord appreciates that because it's not. And sure enough, that's what happened. Carolyn will tell you before any corporal really heard about it. I had read this book because I'd heard, you know, it's about Jesus and all that. 
Okay, Gospel of Thomas. They discovered it in 1945 in southern Egypt. It has 114 sayings of Jesus without any narrative, meaning no stories about where he went or what he did, just the sayings. Here are some of them. Jesus said, recognize what is in your sight, and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you. <laughs> Jesus said, blessed is the lion which becomes man when consumed by man, and cursed is the man whom the lion consumes when the lion becomes man. <laughs> Number 82, Jesus said, he who is near me is near the fire, and he who is far from me is far from the kingdom. <laughs> Do you get a feeling like it's this is all a head fake? It's like, you know, yeah. what? Um, Jesus said, seek and you will find. Yet, what you asked me about in the former times, which I did not tell you then, now I do desire to tell you, but you do not inquire after it. <laughs> I am not making this up. <laughs> and here's the exact one that I mentioned to you. Simon Peter said to them, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. So, you women have something to look forward to. <laughs> That's why the Gospel of Thomas was never, ever by anybody considered to really be part of the testimony, the true testimony of Jesus. There are a lot of others like that, that tell stories that nobody believes, that to give sayings that don't make sense, or are inconsistent with everything else we know. Those are the Gnostic Gospels, they're sometimes called, they're called the pseudepigraphal books, which means false writing. Um, how did I get into all that? <laughs> okay. But it's valuable to know that when you read, when you read Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code, and that stuff, don't believe all of that kind of stuff you read. Because if you actually go back and read the Gospel of Thomas, that's what you're going to read. Okay? All right. Uh, where am I here? Okay. Why were the Gospels written? We talked about the three synoptic Gospels, and I'm going to focus on them in a minute. But why were the Gospels in general written? Until the time of the first Gospel, which we believe was probably Mark, and I will tell you why in a little bit, or if not Mark, some other predecessor, there was a period of oral tradition during which um, all that was known about Jesus and believed about Jesus was simply passed down orally from person to person. Now, lest you think that there's something wrong with that, let me give you a, a little bit... Well, let me say this first, and then I'll explain that. So, the first, the first sort of period that the Gospels represent is the period when Jesus actually was alive and teaching. Okay, that's the first period. Then we have a period of the oral transmission of Jesus' words, in which everything was done by word of mouth. Most Westerners go, well, that, that's when everything got screwed up. That's when they got it all wrong. That's when, you know, because you've all played the game of telephone, right? You know what telephone is? You get a circle of people, and somebody whispers something, one person's ear, you pass around, and then at the end you see how it comes out. And it is laughably different than what happened three minutes ago. That was not what it was like in the oral tradition of the ancient Middle East. The oral tradition of the ancient Middle East, they actually preferred the oral tradition, even though they had writing. Papias, which was a late first century um, church leader, said, yes, we have the books, but I much prefer the spirit and heart of the spoken content of Jesus' life. Now, to give you some idea about the importance there, today in the Middle East, Muslim youths mm -hmm. still memorize all of the Koran. And the Koran is about the same length as our New Testament. They memorize all of it. And they're tested on this. And you guys tell me you can't memorize a few scriptures. <laughs> yeah, they have a big incentive, though. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and you should too. Not the same one, but still a good sense. One, one uh, experience that they had with Arabic Bedouins. Bedouins are the you know the desert people, uh, right? In the 18th, late 18th century, a group of Westerners went in and had the Bedouin the herdsmen, the nomads tell them some of their stories and poems, the things that they passed down from father to son, things that were part of the rite of passage. 
This is the late 18th century, meaning the late 1700s. They wrote a bunch of this stuff down. In the late 20th century, 300 years later, some people took those original records and went back to the Bedouins 300 years later and said, tell us your stories. They were perfect. Absolutely perfect. There were no differences. Another story that I read in, the, in not, one, not your book, but a different book, was an American professor of chemistry went to Beirut, Lebanon in the 1970s. And he was teaching a class, Lebanese young people. And uh, he gave a test. And there was one young man, he accused the young man of cheating because his answer was verbatim out of the book. And when he challenged the young man and said, you cheated, he said, I didn't, professor. And he said, then how could you have gotten that exactly out of the book? He said, I memorized it, the book. I memorized the whole book. <laughs> well, the American professor didn't believe him, so he took him to the dean. And the dean sat them both down, and he took out the book, and he turned to page blah, blah, and he said, recite for me. And the student knew every word in the textbook. <laughs> and the, professor, the American professor apologized. Well, we don't have to do that. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to, but you could. <laughs> Right? So the idea that there was something inherently problematic or wrong with the fact that for the first 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, however long you want to look at it, uh, we'll talk about that, uh, that there was only the oral tradition and things were not written down, really was not a problem for them. In fact, they preferred it and they were really good at it. Um, the reason why they ended up eventually writing down, well, let me tell you why they were reluctant probably at first to write this stuff down. The Jewish people were not, by their first nature, they could all read and write. They were taught to read and write. Education amongst the Jewish people was, was a priority. That's one of the reasons that you get people like, like Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, wants Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these other young Jewish priests, uh, young noblemen, to come and be in his court because they were already so well educated, among other things. Apparently they were pretty too. But um, the, the Jewish people preferred the oral tradition even though it could, they could write. And so unless they had specific motivation, the oral tradition was what they believed was most important. Did you know that, um, that Socrates, the great philosopher Socrates, did not believe in writing? You don't have any writings of Socrates. You have writings of Plato, his student, about Socrates. Socrates believed that if you wrote things down, you would screw up your mind. You would, your mind would become weak if you wrote things down instead of learning them and memorizing them, okay? Uh, Socrates ranks pretty high amongst the brilliant people in the history of the human race, okay? So, the, the disciples by nature would not have been given to want to write things down as a matter of course, like we are. We write everything down. They were a tradition that memorized stuff. Secondly, um, they probably would have found writing materials very expensive. It was very expensive to have writing stuff. That why they, that's why they were special professional people called scribes who did all the writing. Ordinary people didn't do it because it cost too much money. You only had it done when you had to and you paid somebody to do it and they kept the materials. It was also true not only was it expensive to have writing materials, but it was very expensive to reproduce the manuscripts. Everything's written by hand, takes a long time. You, that's not your first recourse. That's not where you go first. So I think all of those, uh, well, and the last reason probably, was that the Christians in the first century expected the parousia, which it means the second coming. Mm. Like, like right now. We, we don't have to write this stuff down because Jesus will be back by Tuesday. I mean, they literally thought, because he, Jesus had said, um, you know, not everyone here will taste death before the coming of the kingdom or before you experience the kingdom. There's a lot of different interpretations about what he meant by that. Some people think that that was, he was talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, and that the experience of seeing Jesus glorified in the presence of, uh, of Elijah and Moses may have been the experience of the kingdom that he was talking about. Or he may have been talking about himself. In the theology class we're going to talk about during Christology on Wednesday, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God as a concept that was the per personified by Jesus. Okay, so... There's so lots of reasons, but the, Jews, the uh, Christians, early Christians, especially thought Jesus was coming back right now. Well, so why did they then start writing this stuff down? Several reasons. One, um, the apostles started dying off. The people who had first-person experience started to die, and especially when Peter and Paul 
were martyred, there was a strong motivation that we need to capture this stuff while there are still people who knew Jesus personally or who knew people who knew people personally, uh, Jesus personally. And so they started to write it down for that reason. Um, it was also true that the church in various parts of the world, it was spreading through various parts of the world, and it was not possible for a, an apostle or for a, an accredited teacher, meaning somebody who had been taught by an apostle, to get everywhere. As it, was, it was growing like wildfire, and in order to be able to make sure that they had the information, that people would be accepting just the testimony from a sermon of Jesus and not have any background. And to be able to keep up with the rapid growth, that's why they began to write things down, even though it took time to reproduce them and send them out, to write in letters and things of that sort. Another reason is because they began, as, as the church began to grow into um, being, including Gentiles, other non-Jews, they had to understand how they fit in as a Jewish Messiah that started in the Jewish belief, but accepted other people. How did you, how do you fit in things like the law and the rites and the customs and the temple uh, without just throwing everything away and starting all over again because Jesus was Jewish? They had, somebody had to sit down and start writing this stuff down as a way to sort through things, to figure it out and communicate about it. And how it was that a religion that started basically as a Jewish religion was now um, Gentiles and others as well. And then, as I mentioned, another reason, the reason, one of the reasons they didn't write things down at first is because they expected Jesus to come back right away, the parousia, the second coming. When he didn't come, then they figured this is going to be a longer drawn out thing than we thought. And so we need to start preparing for a multi-generational even kind of existence of belief in Jesus Christ. And so they started writing it down because it meant people were going to be growing up, Christian parents, Christian kids, new converts. We need to start thinking longer term. And that meant writing things down. But again, one of the most important points in that, I believe, is to understand that um, the accusation people make that oral tradition, oh, this was this was being written down for you know, decades, and they would have forgotten things and gotten it wrong and everything else. No, they probably wouldn't have. And we have very specific evidence that the oral tradition of the Eastern Mediterranean region and, and the Middle Eastern peoples of that time was so important to them, they didn't screw it up. That's the same accusation that was made by liberal uh, scholars about the, the scripture. Since we don't have any extant documents, say from the Old Testament especially, we don't have the original documents. It's been copied. They said, oh, you know, you can't count on anything. It's all been messed up. It's all been, people have edited it and changed it and modified it the way that they wanted and trying to, you know, make their own point and all of that. Well, in the 1940s and early 50s, they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are now the most ancient, original or extant, extant means still existing, documents that we have of some of the Old Testament writings. For instance, the entire book of Isaiah, one of the biggest books in the Bible, is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The astonishing thing they discovered when they found this stuff, which were hundreds and hundreds of years older than any of the other documents that they had, is that there was virtually no difference. Any differences they had would be like a semicolon instead of a comma, you know, so to speak. It would be the addition of a letter here or a drop of a letter there. Nothing of any theological or historical or any other kind of important consequence had been changed. They had to revamp the whole thinking about the transmission of Scripture because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the conclusion they had to come to, even the more liberal scholars who didn't like it, was the people who copied the texts of the Bible, and this is true Old Testament and New Testament. This is true for the people who memorized, because it was oral tradition before the Old Testament writings too, the people who memorized this tradition, they recognized that this was probably the most important important thing they were ever going to do, and they did not make mistakes. They simply didn't. If they made a mistake, it was a, you know, a, oh, a slip of the pen kind of thing. It was not of any consequence with regard to the message being communicated. They didn't insert their own opinions about stuff because they wanted to make a point. It did not happen. We have evidence of that now from the Old Testament Dead Sea Scrolls. We believe that same thing carries through to the New Testament. This was the most important thing these people believed they would ever do. They did not make mistakes about it. Okay, questions about any of that? Okay, I talked before. Let's take a break for five minutes. 
I've got about four and a half minutes after. Let's get back together about 10 after 2. Give you all a chance to break. Thank you. I mentioned it earlier that there were four Gospels, and I sort of gave you um, a little bit of a reason, but let's talk about what the church historically has thought about there being four Gospels. Um, the idea of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, St. Irenaeus in the early, very early 200s, one of the great the fathers of the church, he talked about the uh, four Gospels representing the four corners of the earth, uh, representing the four kinds of peoples that existed. Uh, and we're straying a little bit here, but I, I want to mention to you the church, my point is the church has always tried to make a very strong point and even a defense of the fact that there are four Gospels. And as I say, it was in the 180s, long, long time before Constantine, long time even before the final nailing down of everything, that we, we uh, the decision was made by the churches that these were the Gospels and that the other books of the New Testament were part of canon, meaning they were given by God, not just somebody's good writing. Uh, so uh, Irenaeus said that the four Gospel writers represented the four corners of the earth, the four groups of people, which he called Matthew for the Jews, Mark for the Romans, Luke for the Greeks, and John to the universal world. Um, he identified that the four gospel writers were linked to the four cherubim that are identified in Ezekiel 1 and 10, and then again in Revelation 4. Uh, he also said that the four gospels represented the four faces of Jesus, which is a different way of saying all four of them were looking at the same Jesus but seeing a different side of him, which is sort of what I was saying. When I mentioned Revelation and Ezekiel, historically or traditionally, the uh, four gospel writers have been linked to images that are found in Ezekiel and in Revelation. Matthew has always been identified as a man, as a person. Mark has always been identified as a lion, Luke as an eagle, and John as an ox. And those symbols... When you're traveling in Europe or anywhere that has cathedrals with carvings and things, you will see things like this. Jesus in the middle, upper left, there is a man, an angel. These are the evangelists, the gospel uh, messengers. Okay? So they usually have wings because they were the evangels. Um, so uh, Matthew in the upper left, the, the lower left is the lion, which is Mark. The lower right is the ox, which is Luke. The upper right is the eagle, which is John. And you will see those symbols all over cathedrals. Whenever you see a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, those are the symbols for the four evangelists. And you will, if you've traveled in Europe at all, if you've looked at cathedrals at all, you have seen that. And that's what they stand for. That's the four gospels, the four evangelists, they're called. We refer to Matthew... You know, Matthew was an apostle, but Matthew the evangelist, Mark the evangelist, John the evangelist, Luke the evangelist. Okay? So those were the symbols. And this, of course, is Jesus in the middle. Yeah? Is that who they're referring to in Revelations? Well, no. What happened was Ezekiel and Revelation both have this sort of mysterious... Well, uh, let me back up. Maybe it was. It doesn't plainly say that. Maybe that was who the vision was referring to. A vision of the four evangelists in heaven, for instance. But later on, whether, whether that literally was or whether later on the church used this symbolism to, to represent and stand for those four, um, I don't know. Either way is valid. Either one could be. I am not one that throws out the idea that that could have been a miraculous vision of symbols that God gave the evangelists to represent them in heaven or whatever. Okay? In fact, if you, how many of you all have been to Barcelona? You've been to the uh, Sagrada Familia? If you haven't been to the Sagrada Familia, go buy a ticket. Yeah. Right now. Go. The two of the most astonishing places, Christian places of worship are the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, which is not finished. They expect it to be finished in the 2020s sometime. They started in the early 1800s. Um, and somebody asked uh, Gaudi, the architect and builder, one time, well, when are you going to have this thing done? And he smiled and said, uh, my employer is not in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> well, inside of the, well, in the Sagrada Familia, they've got, on the outside, they've got strong symbols. But there are pinnacles that represent, the, the, there's the tallest one for Jesus. There is one representing Mary, and it's a Catholic church. The, and then there are four pillars that are just barely shorter than Mary. They are to represent the four evangelists. 
the four evangelists are really, really important in the history um, of the church and in the ecclesiology of the church in terms of being the ones on whom our faith is built. And so you will see examples like that where just barely less important than, than the Virgin Mary in Catholic churches they will have. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you'll see things like this. They surround Jesus as being his messengers. Okay. So there was a lot, there's been a lot of emphasis down through history about the importance of the fact that we have four of those. Uh, and this, by the way, is from the Book of Kells, which is from about 800 AD. It is a holy book in Ireland. If you go to, to the university in Dublin, um, you can see King's, King's, uh, King's College. King's College in Dublin. You can see the actual Book of Kells is this ex extraordinarily uh, illustrated Bible from the 800s. Um, the, the National Treasure of Ireland. Uh, you can see it there. And it has, this is one panel. They have another panel. I actually have uh, wooden plaques or plates that I got in Ireland that have all of these on them. I used to have them arranged in, in, uh, in our house. Don't have them up right now. But, um, beautiful things. Okay. Now, uh, we do want to recognize that the four Gospels are not all the same. There is a, a great similarity, which I'm going to talk about quite a bit now, between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three. They are called the Synoptic Gospels, again, same scene or seen together, sometimes people say, because you can lay them out next to each other and see that there's a lot of similarities in terms of the narrative and the discourses. You'll hear me say that a lot. We look at scripture and talk about there's two kinds of things conveyed in there. there are, there's narrative, which is the things that happen. They're, it's like the historical part. Jesus went to Caesarea, or he, you know, he you know, stopped at the well in Samaria that spoke to the woman. Those are the, narr the, the narratives, the historical kind of flow. Then you have what's called discourses, which are the sermons where Jesus stops and he preaches. It's either sayings or sermons. Some of them are very long. I mean, you get in Matthew, the fifth chapter of Matthew, the, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, the Beatitudes in the fifth chapter, and it goes longer than that. Long sermon. There's also one called the Sermon on the Plain, which you don't usually hear about that as much. It's very similar. And then you get also just sayings, where Jesus will tell a parable, or he'll, you know, he'll give a truth. Uh, so narrative, the historic part, what's going on, and the discourses are saying what Jesus says. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar, both in the way they present narrative. There are differences, but they're very similar, and they're very similar in their uh, the discourses. They don't all exactly line up. Then you get John, completely different. John does not line up in, in a harmony of the Gospels. And I should have brought, and maybe I will next week, I have a, a book that has a harmony of all four Gospels, four columns, and then it has it in Greek, too, so that you can see the Greek. Well, the thing is, you've got page after, and they've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John columns. You'll go page after page after page after page after page where you've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew, no John, no John, no John, no John. He doesn't tell the same, same things. Then you come to sections where you've got massive amounts of literature from John, nothing from the other three. They don't, they don't say the same things. They're not contradictory, but the point is, again, John was not con as concerned about the narrative, what Jesus was doing, or where he went, or what he did when he got there. John's concern is explaining what Jesus was about, what it meant. All right? We just had Christmas. You all heard, hear the Christmas stories. We always read Luke because, as I said before, that's the one that Linus reads in the, in the, in the peanut story. Uh, it's the beautiful story. And then Matthew is good. Mark starts with, with, um, with John the Baptist, but he picks up narrative. John, how does John start? What's the first chapter of John? <coughs> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. That's not discourse, and it's not narrative. It's theology. It's about Jesus, the Word, being co-eternal with the Father, and that through him all creation occurred. There's nothing quite like that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is very different, and that's why, it's, that's why he's there. It's because combined with the other three, we get a theological depth of understanding 
that we would not have if God had not inspired by the Holy Spirit for John to write. Marvin? Could it not be probable that he'd already seen the other three books and he said, this is something that I need to write now that hasn't been put down? Well, and we're going to talk about the order here. Uh, I think it's, that it's very interesting uh, that you would mention that right now. Uh, okay. We're going to talk for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, if I were a liberal scholar, I could talk for the next three months or so. Yeah. <laughs> on what is called the synoptic problem. Now, we're, we're backing up now. We're only going to talk about the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because of the significance of John as a different form, I'm going to spend the first hour next week talking about John separately. Um, and then we're going to also get on Acts. To cover Acts in one hour is just obscene, but that's what we're going to do. Because we only have eight weeks. So, but, I want to talk about the synoptic problem. The synoptic problem is not really a problem. That's why I put quotes around it. It's only a problem if we make it one. But it is something that I think is interesting um, that as we as students of Scripture need to be aware of this. And, and let me tell you what the synoptic problem uh, started out as. What it is, basically. The problem is 76% of Mark's Gospel is found in both Matthew and Luke. Often, almost verbatim, same words. 3% of Mark is found uniquely in the Gospel of Luke. 18% of Mark is found uniquely in Matthew, meaning it's in Matthew and not in, in, in Luke. Uh, John, we're not even talking about, okay? Uh, or it's in Luke and it's not Matthew. 58% of the book of Matthew is found, almost verbatim, in both Mark and Luke. 41% of Luke is found in both Matthew and Mark. The train leaves Philadelphia. Okay. Let me give that to you another way. Of the 661 verses in Mark's Gospel, Matthew has 601 of them. And Luke has 308 of them. Only 31 verses in Mark are not found in either Matthew or Luke. Alright? The synoptic problem started, I mean, it started really in the late, late 1700s that people started thinking about this. I could go back further. Augustine in the 5th century actually was the first one to deal with this. But it sort of got left, you know, what Augustine said sort of stuck until uh, the late 1700s. The question was, if we realize that these were three different people, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I believe it was Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we'll talk about that. Um, if they were all real people who wrote these books in real time, then somebody was first. And since the church was not huge at that point, and any documents that were being written about the story of Jesus would probably have been shared, somebody came first, and theirs was probably read by the other ones. Fair? Okay, that's reasonable. So when they started actually, the, the, that reality, that these, things, these are real writings by real people in real history, when they started thinking about who wrote first, they started actually looking at the Gospels, and they discovered this. That Mark, now historically, traditionally, the idea was that the Gospels were in the same order that they are presented in Scripture. That that's the order they were written in. That's not, in, in the Bible, they typically don't put things in the order in which they were chronologically written. I've told you that before. Romans is not the first letter Paul wrote. The first letter Paul wrote was Galatians, which is right in the middle. They put them in order of length. Romans is the longest, so they put it first. Philemon is the shortest, so it comes last. I don't know who thought that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they did it, and now it's not like easily we can change that. okay? Because everything is oriented around that order of Scripture. But I'm going to skip one here, because it will just confuse you. Uh, Augustine had what he called the Augustinian hypothesis. He looked, this is in the, you know, 400s AD, he looked at them and recognized that there were similarities between them, that there were places where there was actually literal, verbatim. And he decided that Matthew did come first. The reason Matthew has always been put first in the New Testament is because it is the most Jewish of the Gospels. It's the one that refers most to Old Testament prophecy and Old Testament themes. And so it was always believed that that made the best bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a gospel, the story of Jesus, but it tells more, it refers more to the things of the Old Testament, so it came as the one in between those two, as the first gospel. 
and then Mark, and then Luke, and then John by itself, but not because they were chronological. Okay? So, Augustine looked at this and he said that yes, there obviously was some acknowledgement between the Gospels, they, they did copy from each other. He believed that Matthew was first, and that Matthew's Gospel was read by Mark and incorporated. And then Mark and Matthew's Gospels both were read by Luke and incorporated. Um, we then get, in the late 1700s, and this was sort of accepted by everybody until the late 1700s, when they started thinking about this again and said, you know, there's some problems with that idea. And so Griesbach is a man who lived in the 1700s and uh, a New Testament scholar. In fact, his translation of the Greek, uh, Greek New Testament was, or his, his translation from uh, the original documents into the Greek New Testament was the most popular for many, many years. And so he believed Matthew was first, like Augustine did, but he believed that Matthew contributed to Luke, and that Matthew and Luke contributed to Mark. Now, one of the problems with this is Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. By a, by a sight, it's shorter than the others. And it's less likely that a Gospel writer who believed they were recording the critically important, remember I said this is the most important thing they'd ever do in their whole life, it struck people starting, you know, after Griesbach to say, why in the world would Mark, or Luke for that matter, take a gospel that was longer and then shorten it and leave things out? Even though Mark is shorter than Matthew or Luke, the narrative sections, the sections that um, record where Jesus went and what he did, are actually longer than the narrative sections in Matthew or Luke, but he has fewer sermons, fewer sayings. So more narrative, more story about what was going on at the time, less of the discourses and sayings, and it's shorter. And so scholars started saying, why in the world would Mark have taken Matthew um, and Luke and cut out part of Jesus' saying? Why would he have removed the Lord's Prayer, for instance, which is not in Mark? Why would he have removed most of the Sermon on the Mount? The long section of Jesus' teaching that's so critically important, like the Beatitudes, they're not in Mark. People said, that doesn't really make sense. It's more likely that someone would take, um, if, would take something that was written earlier and say, I have some things I could add to that, to fill in the story. So by that kind of thinking, and another thing too is when I talk about why would Mark cut, a lot of the things that Mark says are in Matthew's Gospel. I mentioned to you, there are only 61 verses in Mark that are not found in Matthew or Luke. In Matthew's case particularly, he will take a, an exact statement from Mark verbatim, but then he'll add an explanation to it. He'll add another clause, which, you know, which gives a fuller understanding of it. Why would Mark, if he came later, why would he have cut those explanations out? It's more likely that Matthew read Mark's Gospel and said, that's good, I want to use that. But I was there and saw it happen, and here's something that will help explain it even more, and so I'll add that. That makes sense to me, okay? More so than the other way around. So what we ended up with um, were a number of different beliefs that Mark's Gospel was first, and that Mark contributed to Matthew, and then Matthew contributed to Luke. But that too is developed. Now what I'm telling you here is only theory. It's not, this is not absolute. But the idea of what's called Mark and priority, which means Mark is first, and that the others used him, um, is widely accepted. Now, the only real argument anybody has made, serious argument against Mark and priority, has been Matthew was an apostle. He was with Jesus. He experienced this stuff firsthand. Why in the world would he use Mark's gospel as a source when Mark wasn't there? Well, that's not a very strong argument when you actually look at what the text looked like, as I was just explaining. Besides which, you will remember, Mark was the secretary to Peter. And so the Gospel of Mark is very much believed to be the Gospel according to St. Peter. Well, Matthew would have respected Peter, 
even if he didn't mark. And if Matthew perceived, and this is this is my own thing now, this is why I disagree with those guys. If Matthew was looking at what's called the Gospel of Mark, and he knew that this was Peter's work, Peter had been foremost of the apostles, the rock on which I will build my church. Matthew would have been very open to using Peter's account, and then perhaps adding based upon his own experience of it. Fair? See where I'm going with that? Okay, now, let me go back. Memorize this. <laughs> I'm going to try to explain this to you. This is actually a wonderful chart, because this explains really what's called the two-document uh, theory, or sometimes called the four-source theory, or sometimes called the two-document four-source four -source theory. All right. You've got Mark. If we believe, as most scholars do, most scholars believe now that Mark was the first gospel written. You've got Mark. 76% of Mark is recorded or reflected in either Luke or Matthew. Now remember, these two books are longer than Mark. Mark is short. Then Matthew, which is a lot longer, and then Luke, which is somewhat longer than Matthew. So 76% of Mark is in either Matthew or Luke. Then 18% of what remains of Mark is in Matthew alone. 3% of what's in Mark is in Luke alone. Only 3% of Mark is unique to Mark. It's not recorded in the other two synoptic Gospels. <coughs> but you do have 23% of Luke and 25% of Matthew are, are the same, but not in Mark. What would that suggest to you? If Matthew and Luke have 25 and 23% respectively that are the same, but don't come from Mark, what would that suggest to you? They work together. Or someone else. Someone else. Someone else. Someone else. That there was an additional source that Matthew and Luke had access to, especially because this is almost entirely discourse. It's almost entirely sermons and sayings. It has nothing to do with the narrative. Mark actually has more narrative than the other two longer ones. Because of that, it is believed that there was some other source. It is called Q. It's called Q because that stands for Kele. Where's Bob Plenke? Did he? How dare he? <laughs> it's a German word. Kelle is the German word for source. We don't know what it was, and I'm going to talk about that. We don't know where it came from. But the, the logical suggestion is, because there is this much, almost one-fourth of each of these Gospels, does not come from Mark. They do not come from each other, necessarily. They seem to have come from some other source, because they're two exactly the same. There was some other source called Q, or Kelle, which was particularly believed to be a document which recorded not narrative, just sayings and discourses. Remember the Gospel of Thomas that I read to you, the horrible quotes from? That's an example of a book that there's no narrative in that. It's just sayings. You know, it's, 100, I think, 152 sayings. It's believed that there was some other document which became known as Q, Kelle, that was the source of those. And then you have 20% of Matthew is unique just to Matthew, and 35% of Luke is unique just to Luke. It's not Mark, it's not... So, what that meant is that for Luke and Matthew, they believed there were two primary sources, Mark and Kelly, Q. This one having narrative, or not narrative, having discourse and sayings. Then, that's the two-source part. Then you get... Luke added his own stuff from his interviews with apparently Mary, because he's the only one that talks about what was on Mary's heart. How did he know what was on Mary's heart? Because Luke says he interviewed everybody. He talked to Mary. Matthew has got stuff that's unique to Matthew, because there were some things he probably experienced that the other guys either didn't or didn't think was important to include. So you've got two main sources, but you I'm sorry, two main documents that led to this but four sources. There's Mark, there's Kella, Luke's own experience, in his case, and Matthew's own experience in his case. So that's the four sources. One, two, three, four. But two documents. You got that? Does that make sense? Yes. Now, 
That is the most widely accepted theory now as to how the Gospels came to be and what particularly answers the question, why are they, you know, people say, well, yeah, you've got four different Gospels. They're four completely different. But the real question is, how are they so much the same? How is it they have so much material that's, that is almost verbatim the same? This is the best explanation for that. Now, it's not the only explanation for that. There are other theories that there was an original gospel that was written that we don't have anymore that they all refer to. And they, some of them picked this part of it, some of them picked that part of it, and some of them picked the same part of it. There are theories that there were simply fragments that existed either in the oral tradition or in other written pieces, and different ones picked up different pieces of those things, and some of them picked up the same ones, and some of them picked up different ones. Um, there, so there are a number of different theories, but the two-source idea, two-source, four-document, um, two-document, four-source idea, is the one that seems to make the most sense. Now, it is hypothetical. The reason I tell you about this is because it is part of the academic understanding of the New Testament survey and where the Gospels came from, what the process was. We absolutely, absolutely believe that all of this was done under the inspiration and by the direction of God. This is not just a bunch of guys messing around and seeing what they come up with. Our Lord God was involved in this process. And so that's why we believe we have four complementary but different views. Why we have three that are various narratives and discourses and one that's the theological punch at the end. You know, John is the, is the punchline on all of the rest of the setup. Matthew, Mark, and Luke gave us, we think that that is all, that all of this was done by the inspiration of the Spirit. Now, there are some problems. For instance, the very idea that we have a document, Q, which carries the sayings and discourses of Jesus that doesn't exist anymore and is not referred to as a document by anybody else. We get early church fathers, Papias, um, Irenaeus, I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier a, a lot of the late 1st century, early 2nd century writers were talking about the, the Mark's gospel written according to Peter, uh, Matthew writing in a Hebraic style because it's very Jewish, etc. And they're talking about these things. Nobody ever mentions any other document that we would call Q. There are some other docu documents mentioned, which we are aware of. We know what they are. They're not Q. They don't have this stuff. So why would there be a document like that that nobody ever refers to and that we no longer have in existence? It's a mystery. We don't have a good answer to that. Because obviously we, that you would think that that would have been a priority for the Holy Spirit to make sure that got, got held up too, unless the whole purpose for it was to contribute to these other Gospels. I don't know. But that is one of the, one of the questions that come in, uh, concerns me. Yes? But the oral tradition and the memorization of stories and so on would have a very large part back then. That's correct. And they could very well have remembered the same stories that had been taught and both wrote them down. Absolutely. It's possible that Matthew and Luke, as part of the oral tradition theory, that what they, they heard and learned the oral tradition that was the sayings and discourses, and they chose to add the same ones that are different than the ones that Mark would have appealed to. Okay. Guillermo. Peter is the 100% of sources of Mark. I'm sorry, what? 100% of Peter's say is from Mark. Well, we don't know that. We do know that Mark was Peter's secretary, and we do know that Mark wasn't there for everything he wrote, so he got the information from somewhere. The historical knowledge that he was the secretary and assistant, he was with Peter all the way through the last part of his life, all the way up apparently to his death, uh, suggests to us, and the tradition is very strong, again, from the first end of the first century and the early second century, that's way back there. The tradition was that Mark's gospel was based upon what he was told by Peter. And so, while it's called the Gospel of Mark, or the Gospel according to Mark, the content is really from Peter. Because Mark himself wasn't, um, wasn't there the whole time, and he wasn't of that caliber. Matthew was one of the apostles. Luke was, was one of the most trusted friends and colleagues and travelers with uh, Paul, a doctor, very well-educated Gentile, the only Gentile writer of anything in the Bible. And so he made a discipline of doing this and was respected for that and because he was loved and respected by Paul, and that was pretty high acclaim. And then you have John, the beloved 
apostle, who not only was beloved to Jesus, but became the elder statesman of the Christian faith, the only one who lived to a natural death, very old, close to 100, and not only had been with Jesus and in uh, Jerusalem and Palestine, traveled with him for the whole ministry, he then ended up in Ephesus and was the patron of all of Asia Minor. And so, very significant player. So, Mark, simply in terms of credentials, is nowhere near Matthew, Luke, and John, except that he could claim, and others claim for him, Mark doesn't say this in his own gospel, but others claim for him that Mark, John Mark, is presenting Peter's version. Okay? Questions or comments about that? Now, this is only hypothesis. It is our way of trying to sort this out. It is valuable because, for one thing, it gives you a sense of the interrelationship of the Gospels. You know, that you understand that there's a lot that's, that's the same. There's some that's similar to two and but not three. There's some that's completely unique to individual ones. To me, having that just as an understanding, and that's why a harmony of the Gospel is useful, Michael, back to the question we started with. That is, that harmony of the gospel where you line all that stuff up lets you see where is their duplication. Uh, duplication in the positive sense. You know, where have they both got the same materials? And how might they change slightly? How is the wording slightly different? There are places where Matthew and Luke have the same reference. Matthew's is, is um, tilted just slightly more toward the Jewish perception or perspective. And Luke's a little bit more toward the Gentile. It's the same thing, but you can see when you put them alongside each other, the orientation that they had, why, again, we believe by the Spirit of God, he gave them that orientation, was to different audiences in the conveying the same message. Not different, not contradictory, not inconsistent, but giving different uh, facets of the same truth. Yes? You would think that the, the apostles would be the one that would be writing about the life of Jesus and his ministry. And yet, only uh, of the four, only two of them were apostles. Right. Did the other write and then just got lost, or what? Well, not everybody was a writer. Okay. Um, they, they all could write, but not everybody is prone to write. I can write. My first novel's yet to come out because I've been busy. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think that that's probably the reason. That, and it may be because Matthew was the most Jewish. He's the one that God the Holy Spirit chose to do the gospel that the Jews would relate to. Luke, being the Gentile doctor and close to Paul, gave a perspective because he wrote Luke Acts, which is the story of Jesus' early ministry and the story of the church, and they fit together. So there are reasons why you can look at these and go, yeah, these were just the right people to write that stuff. Paul, or I'm sorry, John, the beloved apostle, the one who, young, but his heart was, you know, was so soft toward the things of God. Uh, and, and like Jesus' little brother is the one who comes through and gives the feeling of the theology more so than the history. Okay. So, why? You know, you could say, well, Peter was first, first among them. Um, he contributed Mark's gospel. And he said, I don't have to write this down because Mark, you're my secretary. You do it for me. So why don't they give Peter the credit? Well, traditionally they do. But it was Mark that actually wrote it down. And so they call it the gospel according to Mark. But the tradition has always, from the very earliest time this is mentioned, They've always said the gospel from St. Peter is given through Mark. Okay, so there's never been a tradition that didn't acknowledge the fact that this apparently was Peter's testimony. You say, well, James, the brother of Jesus, was the head of the Jerusalem church. Why didn't he write a gospel? Well, he wrote a letter, you know, the, gospel, the, the letter of James, the epistle of James. And you say, well, so they were contributing in a lot of other different kinds of ways. But God had different purposes for different people. These were the people that he chose to write these books. That's what we believe. Gary, wasn't John the only one actually at the crucifixion? And yet um, they all wrote about it? That's correct. He was the only one at the crucifixion, but in the same way that, I mean, they were far away. You know, they were all pretty close. Uh, they were hiding because they were scared. That's one of the things. John was only probably 16, and so he probably would not have been perceived as a threat uh, when he was standing at the foot of the, of the cross with Mary. And Jesus says, Son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. He gave them to each other to care for. When John, the apostle, the beloved apostle, went to um, Ephesus, he took Mary with him. They have a place that's the traditional home of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Ephesus. Okay. So, anyway, um, 
They were all close by. And in the same way that Luke didn't witness any of that stuff, but he gives us what we believe is an accurate representation because he talked to everyone. You can pretty well bet that while Peter was not at the cross, I'm guessing after, especially after the appearance of the Holy Spirit in the second chapter of Acts, it didn't take him very long to sit Mary and John down and say, tell me everything you saw. I want to know everything about when our Lord was crucified. <coughs> tell me um, And that hadn't been a major focus for them, even though they weren't standing there at the time. There were, of their body, there would be any work. Okay? So I, I want to talk about, <coughs> to give you, to emphasize the fact that this is a theory, it is, it is hypothetical. I believe it's the one that makes most sense. It in no way diminishes the divine inspiration of the Gospels. In fact, it shows that God the Holy Spirit was very active amongst the people doing this to make sure that we got the best possible portrayal from four different perspectives of what, who Jesus was and what his work was and where he went and what he did and what he said. And that is a, a great gift. Now, there are some people... Uh, if I, oh, I need another, another two hours. I'm going to go through this real quick because I want to talk about one other thing. This this is um, this is another illustration of that two document four source theory that you have Mark and Kayla Q, both of which you know they they both contributed to Matthew and Luke, but Luke had some of his own stuff and Matthew had some of his own stuff, and that's how you ended up with Matthew Mark. But Mark being first. Okay. Mark and priority is gone. All right. Uh, I want to give you the, th the real brief overview of the three Gospels, um, the three Synoptic Gospels. The book of Matthew, the traditional author, which I believe to be accurate, is Matthew the Apostle. The date <coughs> is A.D. 58 to 68, although some suggest as early as A.D. 50. And what I was going to get into, which I can't get into great detail now, there are some scholars in the last half of the 20th century, a man named John A.T. Robinson, another French scholar named Jean Carmignac, and um, I'm sure I get his name right. Claude Trasmontan, another Frenchman, and John Wenham, an Englishman, who have all gone back and done new analysis and said they believe that none of the Gospels were written later than the 40s which meant less, you know, within a decade or so of Jesus' death. What they've done, especially uh, Carmen Yac and the other Frenchman, uh, Tr Tremont, whatever it was, <laughs> that they did not only a historical but a philological analysis. Philology is the study of language. What they did, starting with Carmen Yac, is he took, took the Greek Gospels and he translated them in reverse back into Hebrew. Again, these were native Hebrew speakers, or they would have spoken Aramaic too, who wrote in Greek because it was the scholarly language of the day. Well, Carmen Yac and others in the last half of the 20th century translated it back into Hebrew, and they said, this started as Hebrew. It had to start as Hebrew. The word construction, the sentence construction, none of it makes any sense unless they started with Hebrew and then translated it into Greek. Well, based upon that, for instance, Garmignac says that uh, the latest dates for Mark would be around 50 to 55. Um, for Matthew, between 55 and 60, and for Luke, between 58 and 60. But he believes more accurate dates would be um, Mark in 42, Matthew around 50, and Luke just a barely a little after 50, maybe even a little less which is a radical departure from the liberal interpretations, which some of which have said this stuff wasn't written until 150s or later, which, again, the best scholars don't believe that anymore. The best scholars are beginning to believe dates in the 50s and early 60s, which means 20 to 30 years after Jesus' death, um, or even earlier. And the latest scholarship is suggesting even earlier, based upon philology as well as history and various other things. So, I've given you a fairly traditional but evangelical date of 58 to 68, it could have been earlier. The most Jewish of the Gospels that shows Jesus to be greater than Moses, the son of David, the kingly Messiah, who fulfills Jewish prophecy. The purpose is to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. So it is a very much a Jewish message. Outline, I'm not going to go through this, if, if you've got this book, there's a really good outline. In fact, I think there may be in the other one too. Yes. Uh, in Elwood. Yes. Uh, Yarborough and Elwood. 
So um, one thing I would say about Matthew that's kind of interesting is that Matthew has fought, it, it alternates between discourses, that is sermons, and narrative, what Jesus does. And it, it, it goes from one to the other. In fact, there are five great discourses, the Sermon on the Mount being the first one, for instance. Five great discourses in Matthew. Some scholars have said they believe that Matthew, being the most Jewish of the scholars, was very intentional about having the five great discourses as an echo to the five books of Moses. Okay, the Torah, the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, is far and away the authoritative part of the Jewish Bible. You know, the prophets and the writings are important, but the law is the important part. You know, and that's the five books. And some people believe Moses, uh, or Moses, Matthew, wrote the five discourses of Jesus at length, interspersed them with narrative, in order to have five points to match. It's sort of the new law, if you will, that Jesus brought. Um, key verses would include Matthew 16, 13 to 19. Uh, who do people say the Son of Man is? Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? You are the Christ. The Messiah, it would be if it was in Hebrew. The Son of the Living God. That's the message of Matthew. This is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one we've been waiting for as Jewish people. And also from Matthew 28, which is the Great Commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Those are two key verses that tell you the messianic expectation that Jesus fulfilled and the fact, and this is another thing in Matthew, as Jewish as he is, he's the one, surprisingly, that has a lot of strong emphasis in, in sort of strong flashes like this of the fact that it's not just for the Jews. It's for everyone else, too. Okay. The book of Mark. Traditionally, John Mark, associate of Peter and Paul. I have to say traditionally. I really believe that's the case, but there are people who disagree with it. We believe A.D. 57 to 60. We do believe it's probably the first, and so wherever the others end up. And by the way, when you talk about how they date these things, I'll give you an example with Luke. Luke wrote Luke's Gospel and the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts ends very abruptly with Paul having been arrested, sent through very rough waters to Rome. And he's in Rome awaiting trial. The story ends. We know that Paul arrived in Rome in 63 AD, which means, and, and the suggestion is, if, if Luke is writing up to that point and he just stopped, some people have suggested that he either did or planned to write a third book, you know, because we believe that Paul was not executed at that time. He was actually released from prison, traveled for uh, two or three more years, and then was arrested again and, and martyred in Rome. But, the idea that Luke stops right there means probably his book was written right at that point. There was nothing more to report right then. Okay, So we believe that book ended 63 AD. You back up from that, that means that Luke would have had to have been written prior to 62 AD at the latest. And if we believe that Luke was one of the later of the, of the Synoptic Gospels, that means that gives us kind of a date for Matthew and then Luke Mark before that, based upon the idea that Mark was the first Gospel. So we do have some points of time that we can nail down and then work from that in a reasonable way. So, the book of Mark, 57 to 60, I think is probably earlier than that. I'm giving you a fairly traditional date here. Probably the first gospel written, a likely source document for the other synoptic gospels, recording it, Peter's memories of Jesus. The purpose is to show Jesus as God's son and the suffering servant. There is a lot in Mark about Jesus sacrificing himself for us really suffering for us, you know, strong emphasis on the weeping in, in Gethsemane, things like that. Um, again, I'm not going to give you the outline, you've got those. Key verses for Mark, Mark 10, 42, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, that I give the suffering servants, Jesus preached that to his followers too. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, the suffering servant. And from Mark 8, 34, then he called a crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This whole idea of the suffering servant for Jesus, as well as for his disciples. The book of Luke. 
traditionally Luke, companion of Paul, AD 658 to 63, written by a Gentile, the Gospel of Luke is the most universal, showing Jesus as the compassionate Savior of the whole world. All right? Um, he's very careful. For instance, Matthew, which is very Jewish, gives a genealogy. The genealogy goes back to Abraham, because he's writing for Jews, and that's where they saw their source. Luke gives a genealogy that goes all the way back to Adam. It goes further back, so that everyone, all of us, could see ourselves as in some way associated with the genealogy of Jesus. It's an example. Uh, his purpose is to show Jesus as the good news who cares for the poor and broken and desires salvation for all. Luke is fascinating because he talks more about women than anybody else. There are a lot of women in Luke's Gospel. He talks more about the Holy Spirit than anybody else, any of the other Gospels. He talks about joy more than anyone and more about prayer than any of the other Gospels. So he's got a number of themes that really strongly recur throughout the, the book of Luke. Um, Luke 1, 1 to 4, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they have been handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. This probably means oral tradition. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, Theophilus literally means uh, lover of God. So that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. And Luke then proceeds. He has investigated thoroughly, wants to get an orderly account of all these things. And then from Luke 19, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Okay? So, our Gospels. As I say, um, there's a lot of material. I don't need to go through and reiterate all the stuff that's in those books you have, because I think they do a really good job with it. So I encourage you to spend some time with that. Much of what I've given you today in terms of background kind of stuff, of dating and that and whatnot, remember this is um, hypothetical. We don't know it for a fact. We've got to have some humility about it. But it's important for us, if nothing else, than to say these things are real. Real people wrote them at a certain time in history with certain purposes of intent by the direction, blessings you guys, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, but they are real things. Somebody in, you know, in Paris in the 1920s didn't get really wiped out on absinthe and decide, oh, I'm going to write some stuff and say it came from God. No. We study this because it's real. And these were real people. And it is honoring to God when with a humble heart, and an open heart, we seek after his truth. Any questions or comments about any of this? It's right now three o'clock. I didn't use you too much. Questions? Is this working for you? Okay. God bless you all. Have a great week. I will see many of you.